Oh my goodness, is this where the uh, elevator uh, goes? You're going to have real trouble with Dr. Godfrey, I'm just saying. Because uh, I'm taller than he is, and if this is a problem for me. Uh, I'll just, at least you have the audio, I'll just uh, sort of... Uh, what a pleasure to be back at New Life, uh, and uh, particularly to um, be able to uh, share this schedule with uh, friends I haven't seen in a long time, uh, brothers I uh, highly respect. I am glad that Dr. Godfrey's not here. He just makes me nervous, uh, especially when I'm talking about Calvin, uh, because he knew Calvin, and... <laughs> and uh, so I'm kind of the secondary source. <laughs> but um, I'd rather preach the Word than, than talk about uh, Calvin's view of Scripture, but sometimes we need to take these moments, don't we, to step back and uh, ask ourselves why, especially in a, in a time uh, when we're just not always surrounded by like-minded people, <laughs> particularly throughout the week. Uh, sometimes, uh, even in churches, people uh, uh, go to churches where perhaps they have a higher view of Scripture than, than the church does sometimes. And so, it's very important for us to go back and ask ourselves, why do we take the Scriptures so seriously? And so, I've been asked to focus on Calvin and sola scriptura, by scripture alone. Uh, and to do that, I would like to first of all set up what Calvin understood as a classic patristic, that is, church father's view of sola scriptura. Uh, first of all, you go all the way back to the New Testament itself, and you have Paul, for example, telling the Thessalonians that the gospel of Luke is Scripture, for the Scripture says, he tells them. Uh, Peter refers to Paul's letters as part of the rest of Scriptures in 2 Peter 3.16. And so it was natural for those who followed after the apostles, of course, to refer to Scripture in as high terms as the apostles did themselves. Polycarp, a disciple of John, refers to many passages in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, calling them Scripture. So does Clement of Rome in a letter dated 96 A.D., about 40 years after Paul wrote his letter to the Corinthians. He wrote his letter to the same church, quoting passages from many parts of the New Testament. In the second century, Irenaeus said, We have learned from none other the plan of our salvation than from those through whom the gospel has come down to us, which they did at one time proclaim in public, and at a later period by the will of God, handed down to us in the Scriptures in, uh, uh, to be the ground and pillar of our faith. You see the, the, the important point there that first there were traditions their proclamation, their, their oral proclamation of the gospel, but then afterwards handed down to us in the form of not ongoing uh, apostolic uh, deposit, but in the form of the scriptures. Tertullian, in the late second century, writes, silence, silence on such blasphemy, referring to the denial of the deity of Christ. Let us be content with saying that, that Christ died, the Son of the Father, and let this suffice because the Scriptures have told us so much. For even the Apostle, to his declaration, which he makes not without feeling the weight of it, that Christ died, immediately adds, according to the Scriptures, in order that he may alleviate the harshness of the statement by the authority of Scripture, and so remove offense from the reader. If something, he adds, is nowhere written, then let it fear the woe which impends on all who add to or take away from the written word. For Athanasius, uh, the, uh, in the early uh, fourth century, Athanasius said, the holy and inspired scriptures are 
fully sufficient for the proclamation of the truth. Fully sufficient. Cyril of Jerusalem said, Here I have laid out a summary of the faith with Scripture proofs for concerning the divine and holy mysteries of the faith. Not even a casual statement can be delivered without the Holy Scriptures. Nor must we be drawn aside by mere plausibility and artifices of speech, even to me, the Bishop of Jerusalem, who tell you these things. Give not absolute credence unless you receive the proof of the things which I announce from the divine scriptures. For this salvation, which we believe depends not on ingenious reasoning, but on demonstration of the holy scriptures. The early third century, Origen, not exactly my favorite theologian, uh, nevertheless referred to the scriptures as our canonical rule. We will understand the truth, he says, if we listen to Paul's words as the very words of God without error. Chrysostom, patriarch of Constantinople, said, uh, the clarity of that which is necessary is plain. All things are clear and open that are in the divine scriptures. The necessary things are plain. So here we have the inerrancy, the inspiration, the sufficiency, and the clarity of Scripture, all affirmed by these ancient witnesses. Basil of Caesarea in the fourth century instructed, believe those things which are written, the things which are not written, seek not. For it is a manifest defection from the faith, a proof of arrogance, either to reject anything of what is written or to introduce anything that is not. Augustine, of course, set forth an established rule uh, that Scripture interprets Scripture. In addition to all of these other claims uh, that I've quoted from other church fathers, Augustine also said Scripture interprets Scripture. Maximinus. Uh, in the 5th century, said, if you produce from the divine scriptures something that we all share, we have to listen. But those words which are not found in the scriptures are under no circumstance accepted by us, especially since the Lord warns us, saying, in vain they worship me, teaching human commandments and precepts. I go on and on with these uh, quotations, but these suffice to give you the gist of the classic, historic, orthodox Catholic interpretation of sola scriptura that has come down to us before it was mangled in the Middle Ages. J. N. D. Kelly, a highly respected authority, and patristic scholar, said, the clearest token of the prestige enjoyed by scripture is the fact that the entire theological effort of the fathers, whether their aims were polemical or constructive, was expended upon what amounted to the exposition of the Bible. Further, it was everywhere taken for granted that for any doctrine to win acceptance, it had to first establish its scriptural basis. All the way to the 13th century, you have Thomas Aquinas saying this, it is a manifest error to say that something manifestly false must ever be understood in the words of Scripture. For there cannot be anything false under divine scripture passed on by the Holy Spirit, just as there cannot be anything false under the faith that is taught by it. After all, it is a revelation of the Holy Spirit who is the principal author of holy scripture. So the Reformation was not about the inspiration and inerrancy of holy scripture. Amazingly, you know, uh, the, the, the Reformation day, uh, debate was in some ways child's play compared to the debates within Protestantism today. Well, then what was it over? It was over the sufficiency of Scripture, uh, particularly the sufficiency of Scripture in relation to tradition. You see, uh, only in the Middle Ages, especially from the 12th century onward, do we begin to see the idea emerging that scripture and tradition form two streams of one deposit of the faith. 
You have the written scriptures, but then you have the unwritten traditions. And now you have the living voice of the church as opposed to the dead letter of Scripture. But even in that era, even of the Middle Ages, you had very distinguished theologians who nevertheless taught something very close to, if not, uh, in fact, the doctrine of sola scriptura, that at the end of the day, uh, though we submit to the ministerial authority of the church, the scriptures have the last word. Only at the Council of Trent in the 16th century that condemned the Reformation was the idea set into stone for the first time that there are these two streams of tradition with an ongoing living magisterium, living tradition in the form of the Pope. The Council of Trent established the view that Scripture and tradition are two forms of the Word of God, one written and one unwritten. In other words, the apostolic office is still open. There is still an office of apostle in the church. That office was not temporary, but continues through the living successors of the apostles, particularly the successors of Peter. But it wasn't until the First Vatican Council in 1870 that the doctrine of papal infallibility was finally established. Isn't that amazing? When you think about it, 1870. A church that's always the same, it's never changed. Only in 1870 was the doctrine of papal infallibility uh, set in stone. And then repeating the arguments of Trent, the Second Vatican Council distinguishes Scripture and tradition by the same spurious appeal to 2 Corinthians 3, 6, that the radical Protestants, the Anabaptists at the time of the Reformation used, to separate the written word from the Holy Spirit speaking in their divinely inspired prophet. Not surprisingly, Calvin said to Cardinal Satellito, we are faced by two sects the Pope and the Anabaptists. He says, for although they seem very different, they are exactly the same in this respect. They subvert the written word of God in order to make room for their own revelations and falsehoods. The Bible is a written canon, to be sure, but the church is a living community, we're told, with the Pope as a living mouthpiece of Christ. The Second Vatican Council puts it this way, sacred tradition and sacred scripture are bound closely together, flowing out from the same divine wellspring, come together in some fashion to form one thing and move toward the same goal. It transmits it to the successors of the apostles so that enlightened by the spirit of truth, they may faithfully preserve, expound, and spread it abroad by their preaching. Thus it comes about that the church does not draw her certainty about all revealed truths from the Scriptures alone. Hence, both Scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal feelings of devotion and reverence. Sacred tradition and sacred Scripture make up one single deposit of the Word of God. And Pope Benedict... Uh, before his uh, retirement replied to the, the whole notion of sola scriptura, quote, since there are so many extra scriptural dogmas that theologians must hold, what sense is there in talking about the sufficiency of scripture? Scripture is not revelation, but at most only a part of the latter's greater reality. So Rome does not accept the absolute distinction between the extraordinary ministry of the apostles and the ordinary ministry of those who came afterward. And that was one of the crucial points of difference between the reformers and the followers of the pope. See, the reformers believed that 
basis of scriptural authority uh, and sufficiency was the fact that it came from the Father in the Son by the Spirit. In other words, they had a Trinitarian understanding of the Scriptures. Peter Martyr Vermilly, one of the Reformers, uh, said, it is an established point of Scripture that thus saith the Lord should be the starting point and the end point for all of our theology and practice. However, Jerome Zanke, another Italian reformer, uh, uh, went so far as to say that the Scriptures are inspired and are only rule for faith and practice because of the matter contained within it, namely Jesus Christ. And yet also, we know that the Scriptures are holy and divine because the Holy Spirit inspired these texts and illumines our hearts to embrace them. All of those are true. You can't have one without the other. They're like three legs of a stool. It's not just because it comes from the word of an unerring sovereign father, but also because it's the manger, as Luther said, in which the baby Jesus is laid. But also because the Holy Spirit is the one who perfected human speech to be able to convey in all of its simplicity, lack of dignity, the most dignified message that has ever been uttered. So it comes from the Father, in the Son, by the Spirit. And so I would like to focus the remainder of my time here on Calvin's concentration on this very question of sola scriptura, particularly in his expose of the Council of Trent on this topic. There's probably no better place to go. I'm going to throw in some quotes from elsewhere, but really focus on Calvin's antidote, as he calls it, the antidote to the Council of Trent, particularly on the fourth session of the Council focusing on the doctrine of Scripture. In his dedication of the Institutes of the Christian Religion to the King of France, Francis I, Calvin assured the king, I am summarizing here nothing more than the evangelical Catholic faith. After all, Catholic means universal, and Roman means not. <laughs> the bishop of Rome originally was merely one of the pastors of the church, equal to the other pastors of the church. In fact, the 6th century bishop of Rome, Gregory the Great, said that title, universal pontiff, is a form of proud address, and any bishop who assumes it is a precursor to Antichrist. So the current pope, who loved that label, was schismatic in Calvin's view. Well, it's not like Luther and Calvin were the first people to say this. The whole Eastern church had said it centuries before. Writing to the French king, Henri II, Calvin wrote, We have here laid down with simplicity a brief confession of the faith we hold, which we trust you will find in accordance with that of the Catholic Church. The Reformers did not set out to create a new doctrine of Scripture. They set out to recover the doctrine of Scripture that was held through all of, of the great centuries of the church. Calvin's approach was therefore quite different from that of the radical reformers. Uh, Anabaptist scholar Leonard Verdun notes, they were not interested in any continuity with the church of the past. For them, that church was a fallen creature. See, not so for Calvin. Uh, Calvin didn't believe that it was, it was uh, a, a fallen creature we have no connection to or should seek to have no connection to. We should try to reform the church. We're the true Catholics, the Reformers said. The Reformed have no controversy at all with the true Catholic Church. You know, he told Cardinal Satellito, daringly, that our agreement with antiquity is far closer than yours. 
And we are only trying to renew that ancient form of the church that has been distorted by illiterate men and was afterwards mangled and almost destroyed by your Roman pontiff and his faction. Will you obtrude upon me, Cardinal, for the church, a body which furiously persecutes everything sanctioned by our holy religion, both as delivered by the oracles of God and embodied in the writings of the Holy Fathers and approved by our ancient councils? And as I say, Calvin's criticism of papal absolutism here are hardly novel. Um, there was a whole movement to try to place popes under councils just before the Reformation. Actually, it lasted for about 300 years. The Fifth Lateran Council ended that with the armies <laughs> in 1517, the year Luther nailed his 95 theses to the Wittenberg door. Luther wasn't starting something new in questioning papal absolutism. Those who wanted councils to be over popes had already coined the term papalism and papists for those who believed in this strange view that the pope should be even over ecumenical councils. But this was particularly a difficult century, the 14th, because three different popes claimed the chair of St. Peter. It was called the Western Schism, and it was only concluded with the Council of Constance. Uh, here is one description of a whole era. For nearly half a century, he writes, the church was split into two or three obediences that excommunicated one another so that every Catholic lived under excommunication by one pope or another for a century. And in the last analysis, no one could say with certainty which of the contenders had right on his side. The church no longer offered certainty of salvation. She had become questionable in her whole objective form. The true church, the pledge of salvation, had to be sought outside the institution. And that tragic quote comes from Pope Benedict. So like Luther, Calvin appealed to the emperor to assume the mantle of Constantine and Charlemagne. We can be critical of it, but it, it, it's certainly a part of its uh, context and history. Calling upon Charles V to call an ecumenical council to heal Christendom. The man standing in the way was Paul Farnese, Pope Paul III, a ravenous notoriously corrupt and despicable character, even according to his own family. Um, he was made a cardinal at the age of 15 with the aid of his sister Julia, mistress of the Borgia Pope Alexander VI. Then he took on mistresses himself and made uh, all of his uh, uh, sons cardinal dukes. The Emperor Charles V announced a council for, as he put it, the general reformation of the church. But Farnese, Pope Paul III, was infuriated and threatened excommunication. He said, remember, you're the sword, not the head. Since the emperor needed the pope's support for his war with France, he drew back. Instead, the pope called his own council the kangaroo court that we know as the Council of Trent. It spanned 18 years. And Calvin's antidote was the earliest and fullest response. So the remainder of my comments will be on Calvin's comments on the fourth session uh, of the council on Scripture. After reviewing the major delegates, the Pope's hired crew, as Calvin put it, and their staggering lack of qualifications that he was only too cheerful to enumerate, he notes the flowery prefatory address in which one monk celebrates Pope Paul III's eternal heights. And Calvin replies, as to your proclaiming him worthy of heaven, I don't know if you are aware of the universal belief that he was unworthy of the earth. <laughs> Have you forgotten how great value God sets upon his kingdom which is comprehended under the preaching of the word? 
So to appreciate Calvin's view of the relationship between Scripture and tradition, you have to understand his basic presuppositions. First, he's convinced that there is a qualitative difference between the foundation-laying era of the apostles that gave us the canon and the ordinary ministry that proclaims the canon. The one is magisterial, that means ruling. The other is ministerial, meaning serving. The one is given by inspiration. The one is extended by illumination. And so the church's teaching can't be infallible, but it is illumined by the Holy Spirit. Think of it this way. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Thessalonians, says, and we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as it is really the word of God, which is at work in you believers. You see, the word of God is living and powerful. You don't need a living teacher. You do need a teacher. You do need a living teacher, but you don't need a living teacher to establish the authority of Scripture. You need a living teacher to explain and expound the Scripture. But the Scripture itself is living and active. When Paul defends his own extraordinary office, he takes pains to say, look, I was called directly by Jesus Christ. I didn't talk to anybody. I didn't go talk to Peter and get his blessing. Jesus knocked me off a horse and revealed himself to me, and then I, I got the seminary for a while, just one-on-one -on -one with Jesus. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel was preached by me, that the gospel preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. He goes so far as to call it my gospel. But he, he would have had some sharp words for Timothy if he had gone around talking about my gospel. When he comes, we come to Paul's instruction to Timothy, things are very different. Paul encourages Timothy when he's wondering about his calling, his ministerial calling. He doesn't tell him, now remember your Damascus Road experience. Now remember when, when Jesus threw you off the road. Remember when you had this direct encounter with Jesus. No, he says, remember the gift that was given you when the presbytery laid hands on you. See, now authority is coming through the ministrations of the church. An ordinary ministry, ministers are no longer directly and immediately called by Jesus Christ, but are immediately called through the whole ministry of Christ's body. And so he tells Timothy over and over again to hold fast to the Scriptures, to preserve and guard and protect the deposit, not to extend it or expand upon it. It's a deposit that Timothy is given, and he's to train other men to be able to pass on this deposit, not to add to the deposit, but just to protect and pass it on. Of course, there were other apostolic traditions that weren't written down or preserved for us in Scripture. We've never doubted that. We've never questioned that. The point is that everything that the head of the church deemed necessary for our salvation and life and godliness and worship is laid down in Scripture. And every other tradition that may or may not have been extant uh, among the apostles, is not deemed relevant for us today. Not even Paul places himself above the written scriptures. He says to the Corinthians, I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against the other. See, the Reformation did not bring division in Christendom. The Pope brought division in Christendom. The Word of God creates unity. But when men go beyond what is written, exactly what Paul warned against here happens. We become puffed up 
one against another. You see, Scripture, according to the Reformers, functions as a constitution, and the church in its representative assemblies functions as a court. The purpose of courts is not to write the constitution, but to interpret it. And so it has a ministerial authority. Churches need to know the past and the decisions that have gone before and consult the landmark cases to see how judgments were handed down. It would be foolish for churches to reinvent the wheel, and it's never around. But it's always ministerial. It's always open to correction, unlike the Constitution itself. And so finally, to summarize, uh, uh, very briefly, Calvin says that Rome's argument for the right of the magisterium, ultimately the Pope to interpret Scripture, is based on the conviction, and I think this is a very important point for Calvin, based on the conviction that the Bible itself is obscure. This is still a very big imp uh, point of polemics for Roman Catholic apologists, that the Bible itself is obscure. You need a teacher to clarify what the Bible means. Now, we have a great line in the Westminster Confession that says not everything in Scripture is equally plain or equally clear. We get that. There, there, there are things Peter said that in Paul's letters that are sometimes hard to understand that the unstable distort as they do the other Scriptures to their own destruction. We need teachers. We need good teachers, trained teachers, absolutely. But why would we have teachers if we didn't believe that what is taught is clear? That what is taught is actually there in so many words that we can understand it and expound it. That as the church fathers I quoted mentioned, in the necessary matters, <laughs> Scripture is so clear everyone can understand it until you have a pope. Uh, tell you that uh, it doesn't mean what it seems to be saying on the face of it. Turning the argument of Scripture's lack of clarity on its head, Calvin says in the antidote that it is tradition that has become a wax nose that's appealed to whenever the Pope announces a new revelation. Quote, for whatever they produce, if supported by no authority of Scripture, will be classed among traditions which they insist should have the same authority as the law and the prophets. What then will be permitted to disapprove? They'll just keep putting it in the category of traditions. Doctrine of purgatory, the, 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 the uh, 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 Pope Benedict has uh, conceded that the doctrine of purgatory isn't taught anywhere in Scripture. There's a tradition. They wrench passages out of their context and their ordinary sense. He says, Against opposing arguments, they will always set up this brazen wall. Who are you to question the interpretation of the church? This, no doubt, is what they mean by a saying that is common among them, that Scripture is a wax nose because it can be formed into all shapes. How many times do we hear that today? If postulates of this kind were given to mathematicians, Calvin says, they wouldn't only make an L an inch but prove a mile shorter than an L till they all had thrown everything into confusion. In regard to traditions, I am aware that no infrequent mention of them is made by ancient writers, though not with the intention of carrying our faith beyond the Scriptures, to which they always confine it. The, they only say that certain customs were received from the apostles. Some of them appear to have that origin, but others are unworthy of it. These touch only upon a few points, and such as might be tolerated. But first, this has nothing to do with the doctrine of faith, he adds, but only with external rights subservient to decency and discipline. And secondly, it's still necessary for them to prove that everything to which they give the name is truly an apostolic tradition. We especially repudiate their desire to make certainty of doctrine depend not less on what they call unwritten than on the Scriptures. We must ever adhere to Augustine's rule Faith is conceived from the Scriptures. Calvin says that somehow the Vulgate, the Latin translation that dominated, 
which was just full of corruptions and errors, such as justificare for decaio, to justify, instead to make righteous, though the verb means to declare righteous, that had some impact, or uh, 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 repent, uh, poenitentium agite, do penance. You see, there were all sorts of corruptions uh, of the Latin Vulgate. Calvin says, somehow the Vulgate became the favor of, favorite of the unlearned. That is, those who do not possess any knowledge of the original languages. And he cites all kinds of examples from both Testaments where the Vulgate fails. Farewell then to those who've spent much time and labor in the study of languages that they might search for the genuine sense of Scripture at the fountainhead. At least it has been amply provided by this decree that they shall give no further trouble to the Romanists. Is not this to, to subdue Greece and all of the Eastern churches? Not just us Protestants, but the whole Eastern church as well. Then he turns to the right of interpreting. It's a common place to say that the Reformers gave us the right of private interpretation of Scripture. You ever heard that? Like one of the doctrines of the Reformation. Well, it's just not true. And Calvin is a great example of how that's not true. He says, I come to the right of interpreting. I acknowledge indeed that as Scripture came not by the private will of man, it is unbecoming to rest it to the private sense of any man. Rather, Scripture interprets Scripture. But they demand the sole right of interpretation. Would that they were equal to the performance of so great a task. For the monks would rather eat a volume of learning than to read it. You see the point that he's making here, and he's going to, we'll see it a little bit more clearly here as I wind up. Calvin is making a really ingenious point that basically it is private interpretation that you're following. We don't follow private interpretation. We have a higher view, actually, of councils and, and uh, of the church fathers and so forth. Whatever Paul Farnese decides, everyone will fall in line. This is a dictator. This is a cult leader. This is basically how Calvin is depicting this pope. In fact, he refuses to call him Pope Paul III. He calls him Paul Farnese for a reason. Take the mask off and show that this is one private individual interpreting Scripture for the whole church and no one can question it. He says the interpretation of Scripture must be sought after all from the holy lips of Paul Farnese. It is Farnese who places himself in ob opposition to tradition from the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15 to the ancient ecumenical councils. So I've limited my focus to Calvin's comments on the fourth session on Scripture. If we survey the rest of the antidote, it becomes very clear that for Calvin, the central issue is solo Christo. The central slogan of the Reformation is Christ alone. By Christ alone, we're saved. That is why Scripture at the end of the day is so essential because we have no certainty of the gospel. We have no certainty at all that the good news that has been proclaimed to us is in fact God's good news to us. If Scripture is not sufficient. In fact, Calvin says, Christ alone as he is clothed in his gospel, is the object of our faith. Even the clarity and magisterial authority of Scripture alone is related inseparably to the fact that we receive salvation outside of ourselves, in Christ alone, for us. What happened after this? Well, Yale historian Bruce Gordon observes, the success of Calvin's work was such that the leading German humanist and Catholic polemicist, Johannes Cochleus, wrote a refutation in which he labeled Calvin the worst of all the heretics. But Cochleus 
didn't even deal with any of the seminal arguments on any of these points of Scripture and justification, which was basically all of the antidote. Instead, he, he focused his entire critique on three sentences on confirmation. As late as 1560, amazingly, Calvin was still calling for an ecumenical council. That's his pastor's heart and his love for the unity of the church. He says, he says, we must cry a river of tears for this mangled body of Christ that has been split and torn by factions. He said, this ecumenical council, council should be held in the middle of the nations so it's accessible, and its members must include not only the bishops but representatives elected from the churches that are committed to the Reformation. It must consist of the East and the West, and the Pope may sit as le premier le, the president, the, the first among equals, uh, but he must submit to all of its decisions along with all the parties. The council should focus not merely on the externals, but on the doctrines of scripture and justification. And so it's interesting that he actually said, we'll even let, let the Pope sit in his chair if he wants to. He wears hat, he can do everything, and uh, you know, be brought in on a, on a, you know, a, a, a stretcher if he wants to. We don't, we don't care, that's fine, that's for the unity of the church, but he has to submit to the decisions of this council. It's clear that by 1560, Calvin had given up on the project for a national synod, only an ecumenical council will do, and it was a project that he longed for and prayed for and worked for the rest of his life. When it utterly failed, he turned to Melanchthon, and Melanchthon turned to him. They were friends. Luther sidekicked Melanchthon, and they said, How, maybe we can put together an evangelical council. Uh, then Archbishop Thomas Cranmer, Archbishop of Canterbury, proposed a general synod to unite, unite all the Reformed churches and, and uh, invite the Lutheran churches as well. Calvin replied, for my part, I would not grudge to cross ten seas if it were necessary to make that happen. At, uh, it, alas, it didn't happen, but that shows his willingness. In the wake of the Second Vatican Council, to finish up here, Karl Rahner wrote, one of the leading Roman Catholic scholars, Scripture does not contain the whole truth of the gospel. Consequently, no sola scriptura is possible because part of the truth of revelation is conveyed to us solely through tradition. The church could get along without the scriptures by relying only on her infallible teaching office. There are a lot of Protestants who talk like that as well. If we had time, we'd go into what, you know, surmising what Calvin would say, what would be his antidote to Protestant distractions from the sufficiency of Scripture. But for those who still believe that Calvin's arguments here, his antidote represent the teaching of Scripture and the teaching of the church fathers, the Reformation isn't over.